Welcome to Inside Personal Growth Podcast. Deep dive with us as we unlock the secrets to personal development, empowering you to thrive. Here, growth isn't just a goal, it's a journey. Tune in, transform, and take your life to the next level by listening to just one of our podcasts. Well, welcome back to Inside Personal Growth, and thanks for joining us for another podcast. I think, uh, Sherry, we're getting close to 1,100 podcasts in 17 years. So joining us from the other side of the world, where there's a little bit of unrest going on. Uh, Actually, you're in Jerusalem, so I would assume that the whole country is being affected. But Sherry Mandel is joining us to speak about her book, The Kabbalah of Writing, Mystical Practices for Inspiration and Creativity. Good afternoon to you, Sherry. How are you? You know, times are tough. My granddaughter had a siren in her nursery school, and they just hired an armed guard to sit outside of the nursery school. So, and we're at war, the... Even from Yemen now, they are shooting missiles at us. So it's not an easy time. No, no, I wouldn't think so. And I would think this would be a time kind of segueing into writing. This is an opportunity for people to reflect, write, Mm -hmm. take a time to look deep inside themselves and heal. Um, So much healing needs to go on. And I'm going to let my listeners know a little bit about you, Sherry Mandel, won a National Jewish Book Award in 2004 for her spiritual memoir, The Blessed of a Broken Heart. Um, It's translated into three languages. The book was adapted into a stage play. Her book, The Road to Resilience, From Chaos to Celebration, boy, does that fit today, details the spiritual stages of resilience. She's also the author of Writers of the Holocaust, Uh, and written for numerous magazines and journals, including USA Today. Um, The Times of Israel uh, and Hassad Magazine and Jerusalem Post, she received Moment Magazine Prize Best Short Fiction in 2009 and a Simon Rockvauer Prize for the Personal Essay in 2011. She and her husband direct the Kobe Mandel Foundation, which you can find at Kobe. K-O-B-Y-M-A-N-D-E-L-L dot O-R-G in Israel, which runs groups and camps for bereaved families and children. She is also a certified pastoral counselor and runs support groups for bereaved women. She lectures around the world on grief and resilience. She also teaches creative writing in Jerusalem. And you can join her mailing list. She was mentioning to me, because of the times now, Uh, in Israel. Uh, She didn't specifically set a date for a class, but if you had joined Sherry's mailing list at her website, uh, there she can get your information because we're going to be speaking about how she can help you um, heal during your writing and also write something of significance today. So Sherry, thank you for being with us in these challenging times. Um, If you would, speak with the listeners about the journey and the studies of the Kabbalah. Um, which right in the middle of that is the tree of life, Um, which leads you to writing this book. Um, You know, we look at uh, different spiritual practices, you know, Eastern philosophy says chakras. You look at the, you look at the tree of life and it's got similarities uh, in some respect. And I think we're all looking to have that higher connection with the power of one Um, And so speak with us about that, because you've been through your own challenges with losing a son, uh, setting up this foundation, um, writing all these wonderful books. Uh, And I think it's good for our listeners just to kind of know your own little journey a bit. Okay, so I grew up in New York and I went to college. I got a master's in creative writing and then I traveled and I ended up in Israel and I was Jewish, but I knew nothing about Judaism. And I started learning the Bible. And then I learned a little Kabbalah. And Kabbalah actually means to receive. Lekabel is the verb for to receive. So it's received wisdom. And 
it's a very um, difficult um, learning. Like you could never learn all of it. So what I've done is really simplified it because the sphere out, the sphere out, sphere out means channels. And there are 10 channels that God uses or the divine uses move divine energy to the world. But those spheres, those channels also exist within every human being. So we can think of it as the divine architecture. And it's kind of a scheme. Well, maybe I don't like that word scheme, but a kind of diagram for under, understanding ourselves as well as understanding how God sends this light to the world. And the word spira in Hebrew, in Hebrew words have roots that are associated with other words. So the word spirot is related to the word sefer, which means book or story. And we believe that the world is God's story and we each have our own story. And what I'm trying to do in this book and is to help people tell their stories and to appreciate their stories and to record them, write them. Because if people, I feel like writing is such a tool for healing. And when people write their stories, then they have a new way of understanding themselves and they, they can take the experiences of their lives. But when you look at it through writing, then you have a retrospective intelligence and you can actually change your story by writing about it. Oh, so, so much so. And I couldn't agree with you more because the process of writing is very cathartic, um, no matter what kind of writing it is. And you'll find, most people will find, and I know I did when I wrote my books, that you, you get into a flow and you look at the flow as this so much connection with a greater, higher power. It kind of flows through you. You know, I mean, you can make that happen. You don't make it happen. You allow it to happen. Probably use the wrong words. And you state that writing is a means of appreciating the world, allowing us to pay attention and concentrate so that we can notice and record the unique, sometimes fleeting truths that the divine sends to each of us, our stories. And I, that's what I was just saying. It is being sent. Can you speak with us about the first Sephiroth? Um, which is about will, inspiration, comprehension, as it relates to writing. Well, the first sphera is will, which it's in Hebrew, it's keter, which means crown. So that sphera of will, the um, conduit of will, is our is really our desire to say something. But lots of times people think that will is willpower. And willpower, it's like being on a diet. If you are only using willpower, at least for me, if I'm only using willpower, it won't work because I, I, I can't be constricted like that. But will is also love. So if you think of it as that writing is a way actually of loving the world. So, and also of helping other people. That's the part of this that I want to stress because Writing for ourselves, of course, is very healing. But then when other people are healed, what you write, it amps it up another level. And it's really a way of spreading light in the world. Well, speak with us about that around desire. You know, um, the desire to write, what drives us? You spoke about will in the book that way. And I think that it, it is important because if if there is a budding writer out there, somebody that hasn't written before, let's say we're speaking to a neophyte. When I say they haven't written, they haven't written a book. They haven't written of anything of much length. Um, what advice do you have for about finding the desire and the will? Because what I found was when I went to a certain lot and put music on and I kind of mm, had a schedule every Saturday for three hours. I said, okay, I'm going to sit for three hours. And no matter what happens, if nothing comes up, then it doesn't come up. But if it comes up, 
I write. Interestingly enough, it always came up. But when I, but here's the point: the discipline of setting that time every Saturday was my will and desire to get something completed. So no matter what happened. So I think this is a really important element, this connection between our will and our desire. Right. But I mean, <clears throat> you were very disciplined and a lot of people don't have that discipline. So I would suggest that people just sit down for 10 minutes. You know, I mm -hmm. teach writing classes and I have people write for 10 minutes and they come out with amazing things. So, and then once you start, it's like writing builds its own momentum. So once you start with 10 minutes, then you're free to walk away, but you'll probably want to stay because you may have something that you then want to work on, but not to make writing into a chore, you know, that it's really, I mean, sometimes it is, of course. Right. Sometimes it's its own delight. And so if you can just give yourself a few minutes, I mean, like what I do is I usually have to have a cup of coffee with me and then I have projects. So there are projects I'm working on that I want to return to. But if a person doesn't have a project, they can just start writing, free writing. And when they get stuck to write, I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. And then just see what happens because something will happen. And I agree with you, Greg, about this inner voice that's greater than ourselves. And I experienced that when I was a child because when I would write, I would use a I would use a voice that wasn't the voice I used in everyday in the everyday world. Right. And it was like a voice that was wiser than me and more knowing. So I think everybody has that desire to tap into that voice, but also to tap into language because we use language to think. And the more that we cultivate our language, the better thinkers we can become. And also that means that we're reading with a different eye and we're more concerned with creating a conversation with the world through writing. And that's Agreed. what I mean about the world can inspire you because like, for example, I also write children's books. So I'm always looking for stories everywhere. And, you know, if, if you're not writing stories, just meditations to meditate on, like we have a turtle in our yard, to just look at that turtle, you know, and to count the boxes on his shell. And, it, you know, thinking that I'll write about something makes me more alert and aware and more grateful to the world because I'm seeing it unmasked more. You know, I don't have all my preoccupations about like rushing somewhere or, you know, cooking some food or going to work. Like it allows you to be what it is. Yeah, it's it's like the world provides signs and symbols if you're aware, whether you're using mindfulness or meditation or contemplation to get there. The signs and symbols are there, the turtle, the stop sign, uh, the bombing in your country. You know, there's there's so many things that you can choose and then choose to write about, right? So you state um, that in the Safara there, and pardon me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, you state there's a quality that opposes it. Doubt blocks will and desire, and that can prevent us from defining and expressing our will in the world. Doubt is a really big one for people, right? How do you help student writers overcome their doubts and fears about expressing themselves? Because that is, oh, I'm not, that's the old ego thing coming up saying, I'm not good enough, I can't do this. Um, you know, we know, we all know about the right and the left brain. We know about how the subconscious is there. We know about ego. I think most of my listeners do anyway. But no matter what, it's it's challenging to, um, how do you want to say, coexist with this sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, or suppress it or suppress it. Yeah, I would say don't suppress it. Invite it. Mm -hmm. Because you can use it. You can write about that. Write about how you don't feel 
qualified to talk, to tell your own story or why you don't feel your own competence or you can write to your own doubt you know write a letter to your doubt dear doubt and like that could be great you could find amazing um life in there uh, i really believe that you know also just knowing that everybody has and that in a way for me letting doubt prevent you from acting in the world is kind of a luxury you know yeah yeah life, life is too short for you for people to be so concerned with what other people are going to think because oh so true that i mean look if you look at your books i was looking here at the upside down boy uh, the Israel prime minister. And, and, you know, I think you're somebody, when you look at these various books you've written, you've been very expressive either through the children, the children's books or the road to resilience. Um, it's very clear that you're good at that, but you wrote in there on this part about inspiration. You mentioned just a second ago that it's sourced from the divine. That's a gift of being alert to the world. I got that. Uh, divinity may be hidden anywhere you state. Um, and I would agree with that. But you had a writing exercise around observing and appreciating. Can you speak with the listeners about inspiring our curiosity or hukma, I guess is how you say it, the power of what? Mm -hmm. You know, because I think yeah. that is key when you look at the word what? Right. <laughs> First of all, yeah, you know, I also I used to teach freshman composition in you know in college, and the, we we had a structure for rhetoric, and the first part of that structure is what is it? Yeah. What is this phenomenon, or what is it I'm looking at? To really be present with it and be able to describe it and experience it before saying, why does this exist? Or evaluating it, like, is this good or bad? And I think a lot of us start with the evaluation, why something is good or bad, before we're actually present with, you know, an object or an experience. So that the curiosity is allowing something to open itself to you, really, and to start seeing and and thinking and also researching that's the other great part about writing is that you can do research and find out what other people have said about things and what other people have thought of things. so then your your curiosity leads you toward this conversation with people from the past or understanding like even biology or chemistry or i wrote a short story about somebody who was a nuclear physicist right and it just so happened after I started that story, I gave somebody who was hitchhiking a ride and it turned out she was a physicist. And so she helped me figure out because the story was about somebody who was trying to discover new elements in the um, periodic table. And so just at that moment, I met I had a physicist, physicist in my car to kind of unlock these mysteries. But wouldn't have been so curious if I wasn't working on something. So, and like you said, these sort of signs and symbols, like God sends you these people and experiences that, you know, sometimes they're really not wanted, like war, but um, sometimes they are some, you know, wanted and, and can, can teach you. That's the other thing about writing. You can learn a lot. Yeah, and obviously, um, my heart goes out to you and everybody in Israel for the challenges that you guys are facing right now. And I think that uh, as a result of this, like I said at the top of the show, you know, writing can be extremely healing. And, you know, you, as you follow the tree of life, you come to being or what you call comprehension. And this is the step beyond inspiration that allows you to develop your idea. You know, I'm out there. You just said what, okay? Now I need to, I'm looking deeply at what, 
Now what I have to do is develop this idea after I've determined what, what is, um, <laughs> you know, um, if you would, uh, can you, you, you mentioned Bina is related to the Hebrew work of Bo, B-O-H-E-H? -H? But no, B-O-N-E, Bonnet, B-O-N-E. Bonnet, -E. which Bonnet. means to build. So can you speak with the listeners about some of the techniques of reflection that foster this insight? In other words, we're at a point now where, okay, we're gone to comprehension, we're up bond, we're beyond in, uh, the inspiration state and the ideation state, because I wrote a book um, called Hacking the Gap, A Journey from Inspiration, um, uh, from Intuition to Inspiration and Beyond. And, uh, and I think that when you look at how people create and they get in touch with this higher source, um, you have to find ways to create, find this insight spiritually. Because this whole thing is more of a spiritual, you say mystical practices for inspiration and creativity, very much mystical practices here um, and very spiritual at the same time. Right. I don't I wouldn't call this religious. I would call it spiritual. Right. Yeah, it's definitely not religious. Um, it's if I think it's more literary, actually. <laughs> literary. <laughs> but um, practices for building an essay. One thing that works really well is repetition. I gave my students this assignment like two weeks ago. Start with the words when I think of. When I think of, just keep using those words over and over in the essay. And the repetition gives coherence to the essay. And it also means that it's like a refrain in music. You'll end up somewhere different than where you started. So repetition, just like it's used in music, is really effective in writing. Because writing is a kind of music. And then questioning, just keep asking questions and to understand eventually that every piece of writing is really a question. And the right. more you more you can formulate that question for yourself, the more coherent the essay will be. But that's in the later stages. And, and I'd say that it would apply to both nonfiction and fiction. Um, I think people maybe think, well, nonfiction, no. But I think as much in nonfiction as in fiction, it's always the next question, no matter right. what you're writing. It's like right. me with this podcast. People say, well, you, you, you're you good at asking questions, right? Well, I've been doing it now for 17 years. And it comes natural because what you find is it it just follows on. It's almost like you're building a story when you do a podcast, Okay. Mm -hmm. People don't really realize that, but you are, you're building a story about the book, about the person, about what people want to pull out of this podcast um, right. and what they'll take away. And um, it becomes an art. So it's like you're painting on a canvas and you can actually see the strokes and what's going up. I think that's true with writing too. Would you agree? Yeah. I love the way you described that, but I think, that the world is a question, right? Existence is a question. Yeah, yeah. So that our whole lives are a question and a kind of mystery. So the more you attach to that kind of questioning, I think the more truth that you can reveal in the world. So and yeah. every, every, you know, I think nonfiction even more has questions because you have to interest yourself too when you're writing like you, well, you have to be care you have to be curious right i mean that's the number one and i think people that are curious become really good writers um because they're curious about the world they're asking questions all the time uh, they're trying right. to define their place in this world um and you know you speak about kindness also referred to as hasid i guess is that right did i pronounce it right say it Hesed. Hesed. Uh, yeah. You state that when we write, Hesed enhances our generosity of expression so we don't hold back anything. I'd say that's true. The more generous and kind you are, um, you're giving 
right? How do you advise writing students about using kindness so that they're not, a, you know, they're, you also, and I wanted you to speak about free writing in the, as it relates to this as well. Um, it says miserly with our words or our experiences. You know, it's like giving. I want to just give it all to you. I want you to have it all. You know, it's like, okay, but a lot of times I found when I was writing, and I don't know if this is the kind of writing teacher you are, but this is what I heard. The and I followed this man's advice, write, but don't go back and correct it right away. Don't go back and edit it. Don't go back and do anything with it. Just write. Right. And yeah. that was some of the best advice that I'd gotten from a writing coach was because most people want to write and then they want to correct it right away and they start putting it into word and then they're correcting the words and then they're taking words out and they're doing this and they're doing that. And he said, no, do not do that. I don't know what you think, but I it was great advice for me. No, that's so true, because especially in a longer piece, you just have to get things out. And and not, like I'm also working on a novel. And so like I think half the novel now I had to cut. So if it were that I was working on every sentence, it would just be a big waste. But sometimes you, you know, even with sh um, shorter essays, we call it like clearing your throat. You have to write to get into what you want to say. So later you can get rid of stuff. But that generosity is just allowing yourself to express yourself and to keep going because that's another part of writing is that kind of endurance, the ability to keep working at something and giving yourself that kind of love that you that you deserve to work on this project. Because when you're working on the project, you're also working on yourself. Yeah, it it it's so true. And you know, uh again, I'm gonna ask you to help me pronounce some of these words, but you have this chapter on boundaries, um, which in the Kabbalah is say it for me, the boundary Gavura. one. Gavura. 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 So yeah. this is about our judgment, discernment, and discretion. Mm -hmm. um, you stated that this is about giving what the other can receive. Thus, Gabura and Hasid are always in relationship. How can we utilize these mystical practices to inspire inspire writing? So I get I get this whole part about the relationship between judgment, discernment, discretion, and then this whole issue about giving, right? So because it's like, okay, they really aren't in conflict, but how do you teach these practices to help me inspire my own writing? Yeah, you know, that's a really important point that they're not really in conflict because actually every sphera contains every other sphera. Mm -hmm. So there's also like a, a kindness in Gavura, right? And the kindness in limits because like if you don't set any limits for your children you're not really being kind to them so the idea of gavura and, and chesed of, of it's a sort of opening and then a closing and the the point is to say something or to write something that your audience can receive so i think that the meeting their meeting place in writing is thinking about audience because well, I think you you mentioned it this way um in the same chapter you said that um harmony is not a stopping point but rather an ongoing recalibration of the balance between kindness and limits abundance and boundaries now think about that audience for a second it takes a second to take that in right? That it's a recalibration of the balance between kindness and limits, abundance and boundaries. They both seem very at the opposite ends, right? Kind of opposing. One is 
here and one seems to be all the way over here. Speak with us about how you help the writers find the appropriate balance in their writing um, and expression. Well, I think that balance is also a conflict. So there's a kind of, by recalibration, I mean, there's an ongoing conflict. Like right now, I'm working on something and I'm going back to a draft. So I'm trying to heighten the draft by finding the right words and understanding where I need to develop more. So I'm always looking for that point where, you know, I would say developing more is giving more and finding the, the, the best word in a way is like limitation, you know, like trying to use language in the strongest way I can. So when you bring those together, I think it's a kind of power and harmony isn't perfection. You know, people think things sometimes should be perfect before they send them out to the world, piece of art. And for most people, I don't think we ever reach that point of perfection. But we reach a point where we say, you know, it's ready to go out or or I can't look at this anymore. <laughs> this morning. But isn't it, isn't it, uh, I've heard this at uh, the point between our reality and our potential okay so think about it for a minute because we live in this reality and you say well perfection perfection is a word that in in depending on our reality it can always be better always so that's potential that's where we want to go no matter what it is we can keep shining the the stone and making it prettier and prettier and prettier at what point do you stop like continuing to shine the stone right or grind the stone down or the diamond or whatever it might be the reality is is that it doesn't matter what it is it could always be better right, I, think I think it yeah, yeah go no, ahead no I'm I done think, I think it goes back to where we started where people are insecure about <clears throat> saying something and that they'll right. be judged. And the letting go is just saying, you know, I can handle what other people think because you're not going to think it that long. And one thing my mother taught me is that most people are not paying that much attention to you. Right. So, <laughs> Your mother's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, do whatever you want because right. nobody is really going to care. So right. even if you do something that's a failure, you'll learn from it, you know? So let it go, let it go. And then you go on to the next thing, but like nothing is wasted. Right. I, you, as you said, that reminded me of my little Jewish mother who was about four foot four. <laughs> and she always had these little expressions, you know, and she would say, and this doesn't relate to this interview at all, or maybe it does. Cause it's, she said, it's not how much you earn, it's what you save of what you earn. <laughs> and I can always remember that because that That's was her. just that was just her that was my mother. That was her kind of one of her mottos. It's not how much you earn, it's what you save of what you earn. And the story there is really this. My mother had a very challenging life. I should really write a book about my mom's life. Um, my dad died very early. She then remarried. Um, she was trying to find something to do. But the point of this story is this, that never in her life did she probably earn more than $40,000. When she passed away at 93, now this, that statement that I just made will now come into, she left two houses to her three, four sons um, that were valued in excess of like $3 million. And she left a $1.7 million in cash and she'd never earned more than $40,000 in her life. So it just goes to show you that little statement <laughs> is, is truly an important one. And with that story, because I think I should write her story, 
Uh, you've inspired me this morning to be talking about mothers. Uh, your book is filled with great thought-provoking questions, exercises, spiritual inspiration. Every chapter has more questions at the end, which is great. We were talking about questions in anyway. But for anyone wanting to express themselves through a story or writing, what are three main points that you'd like the listeners to take away or you want to leave our listeners with today about, and I'm going to hold the book up for our listeners because we're going to put a link to Amazon, The Kabbalah of Writing, uh, Mystical Practices for Inspiration and Creativity. And again, we've been on with author Sherry Mandel. Go to her website at Kobe Mandel, K-O-B-Y-M-A-N-D-E-L-L.com or dot org and sign up for Sherry's mailing list there. So Sherry, on that last question, what do you want to leave our listeners with? Yeah, so God created the world with words and we create our own wor worlds with words and words can be used to heal and words can be used to heal other people. So it's really important to tell our stories and to pass them to others and pass them to our children and our grandchildren because often our stories are wisdom. Sometimes they're about breakdowns. Sometimes they're about breakthroughs. But if you don't share them, then, I mean, if you do share them, then that story will live on. Well, that is strong wisdom and advice from somebody who's written a lot of books, who has her degree in writing, who can advise anybody out there who's maybe stuck right now or having second thoughts or challenged by the whole thing of writing. Um, having a coach like Sherry would really be something you should consider. Um, so I want to encourage you to reach out to her. You can get to her through her mailing list at her website. You can also get her personal email address from that website, which that will get to her. But so that if you had questions, you could get to her. You can also donate to her charity uh, through her website because Kobe uh, is her son, passed away. But uh, you can uh, learn more about all the work that she's doing with bereaved mothers, and um, just you are, I, I can tell, just a very generous soul. And it's a great thing that you're doing. So I wanted to thank you for being on Inside Personal Growth, uh, for sharing your wisdom about writing, especially about utilizing the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, uh, to do that with. And I think many of my listeners out there, we go way back. We've had several actual podcasts about the Kabbalah before. So now, or at you, you say it a little bit differently than I do. I think here in the United States, we say Kabbalah. You might say Kabbalah. Uh, <laughs> but but, it, but it, it, at least we got the point. Uh, so Sherry, thanks so much for being on Insight Personal Growth. Thank you. I really enjoyed speaking with you.